this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. This is today, or will be today, the 41st reading and discussion of the book End Time Delusion that Steve Wolberg wrote in, I think, about 2006. A book that is uh, very much important in the time that it was written, or was very much important in the time it was written, and that is as important today. And that probably becomes more important every day because it really deals with all the false end time delusions that are put out in the world like the rapture of the Church of Christ, a future one man antichrist, a diabolical uh, end of the world that is not biblical and of course the state of Israel that is put in the world that is not um, to be found in the Bible, the end time state of Israel that we have today. Yeah? That state is not to be found in the Bible. That is only because of false Bible interpretations. That is very deeply discussed in this book in the last section that Tom and I are still approaching, or uh, still approaching is not the right word, that we are um, quietly approaching, let's say, uh, slowly, slowly approaching, that's the word I want to use, that we are slowly approaching, coming coming to the last section of the book, that is called Exploding the Israel Deception, and uh, I can tell you it is very much worth uh, keeping these, uh, keep these videos following, uh, watching them, recording them, that's what we ask, download them, save them to your own hard disk, uh, share them on any social media that you have, uh, re-upload them on your own YouTube channel or on any other video platform all over the world. We don't have any copyrights with it. We even have the, I'd like to say, confirmation or the uh, allowance of Steve Wahlberg to do this because we spoke with him and he knows that we are doing this reading so and he has no objection to it. 
So spread this around because uh, the devil knows that he only has a short time. And as the devil knows, then we who are informed of the devil also knows that we also only have a short time. And time is running out to tell the people of these end time delusions. And because I could never do that on my own, I am very glad to again welcome my brother Tom Fress from Inquisition Update to the call that who joins me today in the 41st analysis and reading of the book End Time Delusions. Hello, Tom, and welcome. Hello, Yerk, and hello to the listeners. I'm very happy to be here. I just find it very uh, strange that sometimes I just cannot find my words in English when I do the introductory to these videos. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I'm I, an English speaker and I have trouble too. So I stumble about my tongue sometimes. It's just incredible. I don't know why, but anyway... <laughs> Uh, let's go right to the reading because then I read and then that's easier for me. Um, we are in chapter 18 and uh, that is called the ID or the identification of Antichrist. We already read this page and a part of the next one. But uh, for continu continuity sakes, I'd like to repeat this beginning of the chapter um, that we go into there. And of course, as always, Tom will interrupt me when there is any comment that he wants to give about that. And I have to tell the listeners that uh, even though it seems for many people sometimes repetitious what Tom comments, I tell you that the lie has been told so many times in the world and everybody swallows it. The truth needs to be repeated also to sink in, <clears throat> especially since the truth is a view many people didn't did never have in their lives because they went they went to school and they went to church from when they were little and they were quote unquote churched means they were indoctrinated with the views of the priest of the reverend of the pastor uh, they uh, of the church they went to and those people uh, i'd like to say in 99.9 .9 of the time don't ever tell the truth and that's very often not even their own fault very often, not always, but very often, because they didn't know or don't know any better either. So the delusion comes from Satan and comes from the Antichrist, who is not a future person, but is the papacy that runs this world since more than 1500 years when we live in today in 2021. And we are very aware of his delusions he puts out in the world. And that's why Steve Wolpert wrote the book and we are reading this. Now we're going to show you in this chapter, what is the identity of Antichrist? What is the scriptural identity of Antichrist? Don't listen to man. Don't listen to your church pastor or whatever. Read the Bible and you will see who the Antichrist is. And the Bible points in many ways to what we call today the papacy. That's why Douglas Noel Adams has this quote where he says, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, we have at least to consider the possibility that we have a small aquatic bird of the family Anatidae on our hands. Means when it acts like the Antichrist, it talks like the Antichrist, it looks like the Antichrist, we have the possibility at least we have to consider the possibility that the papacy would be, could be that Antichrist spoken of in scripture, prophecy and history. And that's what we are going to do. Each time I travel overseas, the author says, I always carry my passport so I can identify myself before local government officials. Interesting, by the way, that in good old England, people are not obliged to have their identification card with them. Interesting, huh? They just went through the Brexit out of the EU, where in every other country that I know of, you are always obliged to carry your uh, passport, your identification card with you. Uh, and he also says here, Steve Wahlberg, that he does that so that he can identify himself before local government officials. After comparing my face with my photo, they know it's me. In America, my driver's license serves the same purpose. It lists my name, birth date, height, hair color, and current address. These details are not so much for information, but for identification. Now, that exactly is the issue. In addition to the other puzzle pieces we found so far in the book, in the reading of the 105 pages preceding this one, the Bible gives us another highly practical clue to help us identify that which is truly Antichrist. 
we read from the scripture in 1 John chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, where the Bible says, quote, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. In 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, John wrote again, quote, where's the text here? <laughs> oh, here. Sorry, this doesn't, doesn't easily open up my note here of the Bible. This is it. Uh, come on. This, with a new computer, these texts don't, easy, don't easily open anymore. That's a shame. Uh, it used to be so easy, but that's Windows 10. I'm sorry for that. So in 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Thus, the Bible plainly says twice, that the denial that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is a definitive mark of Antichrist. To continue my analogy, if you ever wonder whether something or someone might be Antichrist, just look closely at the information on their passport or driver's license. If you see the words, does not confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you have your answer. Every Christian should confess Jesus has come in the flesh. But this confession must be more than a lips-only statement that Jesus Christ was a real person who was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life and died on a cross for our sins. Amazingly, a person may confess all this and yet still be a deceiver and an antichrist as 2 John chapter 1 verse 7 says. This is a wrong uh, quotation here. It's not 2 John 7, it is 2 John 1, 7. According to the Bible, our confession must be more specific. We must confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And this confession must be genuine, from the heart, prompted by the Spirit of God, as we read in 1 John 4, 2. What does it really mean that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? Well, let's delve deeper and find out. And the, word, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, as we read in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word was Jesus Christ before his nativity in Bethlehem. The word became flesh simply means the infinite Son of God became man. Now here's a key question. What kind of flesh did Jesus become when he fused with humanity? Or mankind, I don't like the term humanity, but let's skip about that. Paul answered with the utmost clarity, quote, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same this is from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, and the emphasis of the same is added by the author. Don't miss it. Paul said Jesus took, quote, the same, unquote, flesh as, quote, unquote, the children have. The children doesn't apply to Adam and Eve, for they were never babies, but were created directly by God in the Garden of Eden. Rather, the children applies to fallen humanity. Or, the whole sentence reads, the children applies to their descendants after sin entered the world. That is, the children applies to fallen mankind. We read in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Thus the Bible plainly says, 
Jesus Christ himself took part of the same flesh we have. You might ask, so what? What does this have to do with Antichrist? <laughs> well, first we must understand what the flesh is. The flesh, between quotation marks, is a biblical expression which describes our basic human, uh, our basic nature as mankind as it has been affected by sin. For Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. In other words, the flesh itself is bad. It's our enemy. It's like a nasty cesspool that often stings and seeks to drag us down. The flesh, between quotation marks, is the channel through which Satan works to tempt us and lead us into actual sin. One of the most impenetrable mysteries found in the Bible is the truth that God sent God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, as we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. It may be hard to fathom, but Jesus Christ took upon himself the very same flesh we have. Why did he do it? So he could relate to us, understand our struggles, understand our experience, understand our temptations, and reach us where we are. In other words, God didn't simply send us a rope. He entered our world's slime and mud to get us out of it. Tom, I have read now a few times that Jesus Christ was coming in the same flesh as all we are. And I know we went about that earlier in another broadcast, but I want you to do a little repetition to our listeners why that is so important that we understand that, because the Antichrist Roman Catholic Church teaches that Jesus Christ not came in our flesh, but came in the flesh of the Virgin Mary, and she was born without sin, according to Roman Catholic dogma. Not according to the Bible, but according to Roman Catholic dogma. That's why this is such an important point, and it is a shame that uh, Steve Wahlberg missed to go into that point, but you know, not everybody can think of everything at the same time. So we are here for, I think, repeat that point a little bit, and I would be great, very grateful, and I think a lot of our listeners, Tom, too, if you could elaborate a little bit on that part, if you please. Well, well certainly, uh, before I start, I want to reiterate what you said uh, you know we all can't think of everything and if I were to write a book I'm sure that I would spend the rest of my life reading my own book and seeing the things that I forgot to mention and uh, but you're absolutely correct uh, in the Roman Catholic Church the synagogue of Satan they teach that Mary made Mary was made of different stuff that Mary was made uh, without sin, that Mary was uh, somehow miraculously conceived so as not to be under the curse of uh, the sinful flesh uh, of the sin of uh, the, gar the Garden of Eden. They, they say in their jargon and their lingo that she was immaculately conceived without the stain of original sin. So that makes Mary different than all the rest of mankind. Her flesh is different. Her constitution is different. And it's from her that Jesus was different. Okay, without the stain of, of original sin. And that contradicts, and very strategically, contradicts what the scripture says and on that basis alone if if you uh, hold the scripture as your standard uh, for judging all things then you would rightly say that uh, Jesus could not be our savior because he was essentially not one of us uh, he would have the same weakness 
as did the animals that the Jews sacrificed on Temple Mount, the lambs and the goats and the doves and the pigeons. And uh, there's no way that someone born without sin, with, un, without the curse of, 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 uh, of original sin, as they call it, of the sin of the Garden of Eden, uh, there's no way that that flesh could redeem ours. It's different than ours. Uh, the, the scripture says of Jesus that he was made like unto sinful man, yet without sin. All right. And uh, so he was made of the same stuff. And it also says in another place that he was tempted just like we are. Every temptation that is known to man, Jesus was tempted and yet without sin. And uh, he conquered sin in our flesh. And so he's truly qualified to be our Savior and Redeemer. He's our single combat warrior against sin, death, and hell. And uh, he truly is our champion. It, when it comes to salvation, Jesus is our Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning, the middle, and the end of our salvation. Our salvation is determined solely upon him. Okay? Only Christ gets credit for our salvation which you would expect if someone claims to be the Alpha and Omega of our, of our salvation. He is our all in all. All we have to do is believe in his precious blood, an atonement for our sin, a substitutionary atonement for our sin. And uh, that's our part. It's a very easy thing to do. And that's no, it's no extraordinary accomplishment to believe it's a very simple thing you either believe it or you don't and uh, the rest is left up entirely to Christ and and he is an efficacious an effectual replacement for us on the cross he bore upon his body our sin yet he was without sin and we lay our hands upon the head of that lamb and transfer our sin to him. And they, our sins are borne upon his body during the, uh, the crucifixion. And he received the penalty of death that fell upon all men at, 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 the, uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the Garden of Eden, at the fall of man. And so... Uh, we have to forgive Steve Wolberg. I'm sure if, uh, if we talk to him about it, he would like to probably edit this portion and include uh, the details of the Jesus that is preached in the Roman Catholic Church compared to the Jesus that is preached in the Scripture. Okay? The Scripture is God's testimony of Jesus Christ. It is without error, and we can believe it. And if anybody adds to it, like the Roman Catholic Church does, we can call it a lie. Mary was not immaculately conceived. She was made of the same sinful flesh that you and I and everyone else is made of. And she passed nothing on to Jesus except his, the, his humanity. Mary was simply a vessel through which God brought forth the man-child, the, the Christ-child. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church would go so far as to say, because of Mary's immaculate conception, that she is a co-redeemer with Jesus. In other words, our salvation is really owed to Mary, because it was through Mary that Jesus came and was immaculately conceived. And without sin, that's how he was able to, to die and bear our sins upon his body. He got that quality from Mary, and that makes her the mother of our salvation. Whereas the scripture says Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. And you have to understand, if he's the Alpha and the Omega, then he's everything in between, too. Okay? 
there's no there's in 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 the biblical uh, plan of salvation marriage not a factor at all but in roman catholicism mary is absolutely necessary and all the uh, the true uh the knowledgeable gratitude of of a knowledgeable roman catholic goes to mary that's why they pray to mary they give thanks to mary because they say that's where Jesus got his virtue, through his mother, Mary, who was immaculately conceived. And the scripture plainly says that uh, all the glory goes to Christ. Why? Because he wasn't immaculately conceived by his mother. He was conceived just exactly the way you and I are. He's born of the same simple flesh that you and I are. He can relate perfectly to every temptation and every foible and every weakness that man suffers from. And yet, he did it without sin. He conquered sin in the flesh that you and I live in. And that's the great fallacy with Roman Catholicism. That's where you get launched into all error. And, and Jesus becomes a secondary factor in your salvation. He's no longer the Alpha and the Omega and everything in between. He's an auxiliary to Mary, okay? He is the son of Mary, just like he's the son of God in the Roman Catholic Church. And as long as they've opened that can of worms in the Roman Catholic Church, then they make the Pope the vicar of Christ or the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and he is to represent Christ on earth, and uh, all of your sins have to be forgiven by the Pope, and he has the keys of heaven and hell and, and, uh, and, uh, and the earth, and you're to worship and obey and serve him. Okay? You see what happens when you open the door of, of uh, perdition? All the demons come out. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church did. They opened up the, the gates of hell and let every false teaching out. And But we don't need to be deceived. We can express our faith, hope, and trust in the written word of God, the authorized King James Version, the 1611. And we go by what it says, no matter what else the Roman Catholic Church and all of her harlot daughters tell us. We have the truth in our possession. We can consult it at any time and find the error of their ways. And uh, in every fashion, at every turn, Roman Catholicism tries to overturn the gospel and make it something else, put their own definition on it, and change the entire nature of it as if the Pope was God. And, uh, and uh, I'm glad that... Uh, that Steve Wolberg wrote this book, and I'm sure he would agree with what we've just said about it. But uh, our faith, hope, and trust lies in Christ and him alone. And Mary was a faithful servant of Almighty God, a vessel through which the Christ child was born. She's blessed forever, but she's not immaculately conceived. She's not a co-redemptrix with Christ. She's not a co-mediatrix. Uh, she's not holy. She's a sinner, just like you and I. And she's waiting in her grave peacefully, uh, probably turned to dust by now. But she's waiting for her reconstitution at the resurrection of the righteous. And she will see her son, and just as we will. Back to you, York. Yeah, she did not ascend to heaven, as the Roman Catholic Church teaches also with the ascension of no. Mary. They've essentially made Mary into the ancient pagan god of ba god and goddess of Babylon. Yeah. She absolutely has made, is is converted to represent Semiramis or Semiramis, however you want to pronounce her name. Uh, 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 she had many other names in different nations. We won't recite them all, but uh, it's it's the great error, the great counterfeit of uh, the ancient Babylonian uh, kingdom. And uh, it's paganism, strictly paganism. And because they don't believe in Christ, they've converted it. Uh, they've kind of made a syncretistic 
melding of Christianity with paganism. Okay, they've mixed the holy with the profane. That's what Roman Catholicism is. The mixture, the admixture of the holy with the Babylonian profane. It's, a, it's, a, it's an eclectic mix of every pagan religion with Christianity thrown in on top of it. And that's what Roman Catholicism is. That's the best you can say about Roman Catholicism. To Listen, here, if, if, if the listeners get only one thing out of this discussion, it is this. It is a travesty. It's a blasphemy of Christ to call Roman Catholicism Christianity. Okay? You're blaspheming the name of Christ when you mix his name with Roman Catholicism. You can speak of Roman Catholicism in that term, Roman Catholicism, or Babylonianism. But to call it Christianity, to put the name of Christ on that, is to blaspheme the name of Christ. It's a serious crime for which is required the blood of the Lamb to purify you from it. But you need to take instruction from someone who knows to call Roman Catholicism Christianity is to blaspheme the name of Christ, a serious blasphemy. And you all need to repent of it, as do I. Roman Catholicism, in no stretch of the imagination, is, is equated with Christianity. It, if, if, if the name Christ is to be invoked, it is to be that Roman Catholicism is a false Christianity, a counterfeit Christianity. And that's even going too far as far as I'm concerned. I would never mix the name, not knowingly, mix the name of Christ with Roman Catholicism. All right, I think that's all I need to say about it. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. And I just want to set the record straight on what I said. It is not for me, it is not my intention to blame Steve Wahlberg for that he didn't look at this point. This is the reason why Tom and I are reading and discussing that book, because there are many points the author in this regard, or the authors, when we speak of the other books that Tom and I read in the past, just don't have a look at. And uh, as Tom said, I'm also quite sure that Steve Wahlberg, when we uh, made him attend of that, uh, when, he, when, he, when we would point him to that, uh, to that point of um, that he left out the Roman Catholic teaching of Mary being um, uh, immaculate conceived in the Roman Catholic teaching and uh, Jesus Christ being part of her flesh instead of our flesh, that he would absolutely agree with us. It is just that I bring this point out and I'm, as Tom, very thankful for Steve Wahlberg putting this book together, mentioning so many other things that we have discussed already and many other things that we are going still to discuss. But, uh, you know, uh, anything can, can slip someone. And by the way, it was his intention to write a book that can everybody read by a little bit more than 200. For, uh, how many pages does it have? <laughs> have to look here. The PDF has 225 pages. Yeah, my book also has uh, some like that. Uh, otherwise, it would probably extend 1,000 pages or whatever if you really put everything in it. But that's the, that's the, important of, uh, the importance of Tom and me not only reading, but also discussing that book, so that we can be a completion to the information that is already given by the author of what Tom and I both are very grateful that he did that. So, just that you understand this correctly. He continues to say, yet in all of this, there's one monumental truth we must never forget, or we will drift into heresy. Even though Jesus quote-unquote took our sinful flesh and shared our humanity, he never committed one sin. He was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, emphasis added by the author. In spite of his real connection with the flesh of mankind, Jesus himself, in his thoughts, in his feelings, and in his character, remained holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. 
We read that in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Now, this is exactly what the Bible says. By taking our flesh, but not participating in its evil, Jesus literally, quote, condemned sin in the flesh, unquote, as we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Which means, he met and conquered the very temptations that give us so much trouble. Not only did Jesus defeat our flesh in our behalf, but he also died for all of our sins wherein we have yielded to temptation, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Thus, he is a perfect and complete Savior. And I put the sentence in blue in, refer in, um, in uh, reference to what Tom and I just spoke about that they want to make Mary a co-redemptrix, a co-savior. That's what that means, to redempt, yep. redemption, save. Yeah? Roman Catholicism makes the Queen of Heaven a co-redemptrix, a co-savior with Jesus Christ, and that is wrong. That is why I put the sentence in blue. He, and only He, Jesus Christ, is a perfect and complete Savior. After his total victory over Satan, Jesus ascended to heaven to become our High Priest. Now notice the following connection between Christ's being tempted in the flesh down here and his present ability up there as our High Priest to help us in our struggles. This quotation comes from the King James, but it is the 1769 Blaney version. That is something we discuss on other points. As you see, when I put um, Bible quotes of the King James in here, it is of an older English. That is the AV 1611 King James Bible. And uh, here Stephen uses the Bible that also I have used for many, many years, which is in many places a not very correct King James Bible, which was corrected in 1769 by a man called Blaney. Anyway, here from the King James Bible we read in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, quote, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession or confession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Unquote. Okay, I, I have a comment here. Yeah, please stop. Uh, if, uh, now, there's great... Uh, effort made in this this particular reference in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 and 16 to emphasize the fact that the reason Jesus is our perfect Savior, our Alpha and Omega, is because he's made of the same stuff that we are. No difference in the stuff that we are made of than what stuff he was made of. And he could relate to us in every way and without any advantage over sin. Yet, he was tempted in every way like as we are because he's made of the same stuff as we are, and yet without sin. That's what made him fit to be our Savior, to, bo to bear on his body our sins and be our Redeemer, okay? To be our propitiation to be our payment, okay? And while we're understanding that when Jesus came, it was, imp it was imperative that he be made just exactly like we are, points to the insufficiency of the old animal sacrificial system. No animal that was ever crucified on Temple Mount in the, in the, in the, uh, in the religious Temple Mount services was adequate to bear our sins. It was symbolic, and it was used to be used by Israel to teach them 
about their coming Messiah who would be made of the same flesh as they are, who could really relate to their sin, who could really bore upon his body their sins and to make restitution, to make reparation, and to make uh, uh, absolution of their sins. And, and that's why the Bible says of the lambs and the goats that it says that, that they could never take away sin. Why? Because the animals couldn't sin to begin with. They were dumb animals. There was no law imposed upon animals uh, to control, to regulate their behavior. Sin cannot be applied to an animal. It says where there is no law, there's no sin. Okay? So animals cannot sin because there's no law given to an animal. There was only the law given to mankind. And therefore, our Redeemer has to be like mankind. Now, ask yourself the question, if you understand this, that it was never sufficient to sacrifice an animal to take away our sins, that the only reason the animals were, were used is, is, is something that's, that's, that's to use something that is sinless, as Jesus was, but that when Christ comes, he would truly take away our sins. And the animals were simply an exercise of education to understand that there has to be a, a substitutionary sacrifice to redeem mankind, to fulfill Daniel's prophecy in chapter 7, or, or chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. So if you understand that the animal, the animal sacrificial system never took away sin, why is the whole Christian world anticipatory of, of the Jews building a temple and beginning animal sacrifices again when they cannot take away sin? And are we so naive as to suppose that God has provided his own begotten son to redeem us from our sin, but he has animals that can take away the sin of the Jews? Is God a respecter of persons? Does God have a different means of salvation for the Jew than he does for the Gentile? Or are we all saved the same way by the same Lamb of God? the one who was made just exactly like us and tempted in every way like we are. Listen, if, if the lambs and goats can take away the sins of the Jews, how can we call ourselves brethren with a saved Jew? They're not made of the same stuff. Okay? There's only one door there's only one way, there's only one truth, there's only one high priest, and his name is Jesus, and he was made of the same flesh as we are. And he's the only one who can take away sin, either for the Jew or the Greek. That's why we are all one in Christ Jesus. That's why the Bible says, He's not a Jew who is a Jew outwardly, but one who is a Jew inwardly. That means there's no difference between Jew and Greek. We're all made of the same sinful flesh. And we're all saved by the same Lamb of God. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, knowing all of that and comprehending all of that, how is it possible that the vast majority of Christianity today insists that God has a means of salvation in Christ for the Gentile, but lambs and goats for the Jews. And therefore, we must build a temple. We must create a priesthood. We must have the ashes of the red heifer to dedicate the temple. We must have the Ark of the Covenant. We must have the, you know, the, the altar and the labor and all the utensils of the animal sacrificial system. And so the Jews can make animal sacrifices and oblations again. For what purpose? Is all of a sudden lambs and goats going to save the Jews from their sins? Do you see how messed up the entire Christian world is? 
Now ask yourself, what in the world ever happened that makes the world believe that the Jews would have any advantage by building a temple and restoring the old Temple Mount worship system? I'll tell you, it's very simple. You can't have, without a Jewish temple, without that sacrificial system in place, without a modern nation state of Israel, without Jews living in the land, without the sacrificial system going, there's no way you can refulfill a 70th week of Daniel and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Do you comprehend what I've just said? It's futurism that makes all of this false teaching necessary. Because, But if you believe the truth that the 70th and final week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and has nothing to say whatsoever, directly or indirectly, about an antichrist, and there's no such thing as a future fulfillment of it, then there is absolutely no scriptural justification for a modern nation state of Israel, nor Jews living in the land, nor animal sacrifices, nor temple, nor, nor uh, Ark of the Covenant, nor any other thing. And we're back to square one. If a Jew wishes to be saved, he must be saved by the precious blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, and be saved like every Jew and every Gentile in history, including Adam and Eve. The Alpha and Omega is the salvation of us all, barring none, accepting none. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. And if you do not believe that he is the Messiah, the propitiation for your sin, your substitutionary propitiation, then you will die in your sin, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. Now that's the truth. That's the observable truth. That's the prophetic truth. That's the scriptural truth. That is the historic truth. And anybody that tells you otherwise is a deceiver. Mark him as a deceiver and follow him wherever he goes. And don't allow anybody else to fall for his deceptions. And you know who I'm speaking about? Virtually every pastor in this country. Almost without exception. They all believe in a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And while they say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the propitiation for all of our sins, and they say everything right, they turn right around and say the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. And they deny that Jesus came in the flesh. That is the spirit of Antichrist. You see, it's built right into the teaching of every pastor in every church in this country. If they say the 70th week of Daniel is future, if they talk about a future seven-year period of time, uh, seven years of great tribulation, they're bringing a lie upon you. They're causing you to, de to deny the Christ that bought you in the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy 2,000 years ago, they're making you say out of the other side of your mouth that Jesus did not come in the flesh. They say the 70th week of Daniel is future. The 70th week of Daniel has never been fulfilled in the, in the past. Is the same as saying Jesus did not come in the flesh. I, I know this is difficult for some people to comprehend, but you can't have it both ways. You can't believe that Jesus came in the flesh 2,000 years ago and redeemed us to God by bearing our sins upon his body. A Messiah the Prince came and did what he came to this world to do and then turn around and say the 70th week of Daniel's future.
You, you've, you've confounded and confused the whole gospel of Jesus Christ when you say the 70th week of Daniel is future. You cannot live with that kind of inconsistency in your life. You cannot confound the gospel that way. You cannot bat- blaspheme the name of Christ that way. But Rome would have us all blaspheming God the same way that they do. Rome is the author of futurism. The Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy is the papacy. And the papacy is the author of futurism. It was never known in the world until about 1805 after the, after the Council of Trent and after the Jesuits decided to start preaching this nonsense in the Protestant seminaries in England and America. Dallas Theological Seminary, one of the greatest aberrations in Christianity, Christian history. Futurism, morning, noon, and night is taught in Dallas Theological Seminary. It's the worst place for a man to preach, learn to preach the gospel. And every one of them came out of, of, of Dallas Theological Seminary preaches futurism. The confounding of face, confusion. Absolute confusion. Tower of Babel all over again. It's the most revered, popular, famous, you name it, theological seminary in this country. The most powerful, the most name-recognized pastors have come out of Dallas Theological Seminary. It's nothing but a Jesuit beehive. And they've confused all the pastors in this country. You can now hardly enter a church that doesn't teach futurism. They maketh and they love lies. They teach lies morning, noon, and night. What good is it to preach Christ and him crucified, the precious blood of Jesus, and then turn around and say he hasn't come yet? He comes in the future. It's no wonder people don't understand the gospel. It's no wonder people get frustrated and leave the faith. And I'll tell you what's even more predictable than that is that they leave the Protestant and evangelical churches and join the Roman Catholic Church. And there's been plenty to do that. Out of the frying pan and right into the flames of hell. You see why it's a sin to call Roman Catholicism Christianity? To mix Christ's name with that abomination? If you don't know it, keep listening. You will. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I think it is actually quite impressing how with the very few Bible verses you can uh, expose the Roman Catholic Church as being a teacher of Antichrist um, uh, theology. In this little part that we just read here, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and the few verses before uh, that state that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh as we are, you just go to your Roman Catholic priest and ask him about the Immaculate Conception of Mary and the Immaculate Conception of Jesus Christ, and how that hangs together, he will tell you Roman Catholic doctrine. And when you compare that to the Bible, you know already that the Jesus is, that is taught in the Roman Catholic Church is not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. And once you understand that, you have to see where does the Jesus Christ of the Roman Catholic Church come from. And then books like... Um, the two Babylons from Alexander Hislop, or uh, Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow, are very helpful to show you that the roots of the Roman Catholic Church are seated in Babylon, where there are the roots of apostasy, apostasy to the Bible. 
Let us just read this King James verse in Hebrews 4 once again before we continue. We have to understand it is so easy to show the faults of the Roman Catholic Church that Tom and I are very often frustrated that the people just don't see it. One or two or three verses of the Bible are enough to expose the Roman Catholic Church as what she really is. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, the quote that we have right here before our eyes, Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Fantastic. That's Jesus, it, man. That's yeah. the gospel right there. That's the gospel. And, that's and, the and essence. That's, that's the passage that you can use to destroy Roman Catholicism. Yeah. Fantastic, the author continues. Jesus Christ is now our high priest in glory because he took our fallen flesh down here and conquered it, we can come directly to him without any other intercession, without the intercession of Mary or quote-unquote dead saints, directly to him by faith up there for mercy, grace and spiritual power. It's true. Today, at this very moment, we have immediate access to his throne. Christ earnestly solicits our approach. We can come boldly. Now Michael Dell has made Dell Computer Corporation one of the fastest growing and most successful companies in the world. How did he do it? By his business model, be direct. Dell computers are not found by at Best Buy, Circuit City or CompUSA. The only way to get one is to go directly to Dell and order one. The genius of the Dell model is that it bypasses the middleman, makes more money and saves us money. That's their secret. It's the same with Jesus Christ. Because he took our flesh, becoming one of us, we can be direct. Today, as our high priest, Jesus lovingly, tenderly and earnestly invites us to bypass all middlemen and come straight to his throne. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 also firmly connects Jesus Christ's coming in the flesh with his high priestly ministry and with his present ability to save us from sin. We read, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Yeah, that's taken right out of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Make reconciliation. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Yeah. That's to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And everybody in the churches will tell you the 70th week of Daniel is future. How ridiculous. They obviously haven't either read the New Testament or they don't understand it. The New Testament is the historical record of just exactly how Messiah the Prince fulfilled every jot and every tittle of Daniel's prophecy. That's the purpose of the New Testament. A historical record. A, a historical record that you can trust implicitly. It's infallible. And for anybody to say that the 70th week of Daniel is future is more than ludicrous. It's diabolical. 
that it is a denial is. that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, as you so often exactly state. Exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. It is the spirit of Antichrist. And that's the least you can say of all the pastors in this country. You know, I know it makes it incredibly uh, mo most unlikely that anyone will believe what Tom Fress says because he condemns every pastor in this country. But I'm not backing down. Not even a little bit. And I'll pay the price, too. I'm not going anywhere until Christ is done with me. I'm going to stand right here and I'm going to tell the truth about the wolves in sheep's clothing behind the pulpits of our churches. They are what they are. And I see no repentance in them. They'll keep talking about this future seven years because they believe the lie. There's no humility in them. There's no repentance in them. They love their error. They love their lie. They believe their lie, and they teach their lie, and they're not going to repent of their lie. So what does that mean? We have to get out of the churches. Starve them to death. If nobody darkened the door of the churches, how would they pay the bills? How would they live so lavishly? How would they have so much power to deceive the people if they had no money? That's what we need to do. The scripture plainly says, suffer not a witch to live. Don't pay her. That's how she lives. By the, by the filthy lucre of the, of the people. You don't pay a bank robber. That's what the pastors of the churches are. They're robbers. And never in the history of the world has it been so evident. It's The answer is just too simple for people. Don't pay them. Stay home. You'd be better off to stay home and read the scriptures the best way you can and count on the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth. That's what I've done for over 20, 30 years now. Stay out of the churches. They're no refuge for God's people. Not unless you love delusion. It's it's very true what we say. If you were Satan and you wanted to deceive God's people, <coughs> where would you seek to deceive them? Where you find them. So where you find them. And where is that? In the churches. And that's where he's found, behind every pulpit. And all he's got to do is convince you that the 70th week of Daniel is future, and he's gotten you to say with your own mouth, that you deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. That's all he's got to do. And that's why you'll see one of these pied pipers of perdition behind every pulpit in this, in this world. The churches have been conquered. They are no refuge for God's people. Whatever good they've done, whatever good they do is offset by the delusion that they spread. Can't you just trust Christ? You have no need that a man should teach you. You have the Spirit of Christ, the Vicar of Christ, to teach you all things and bring back to your memory everything that Christ told you. You know, there comes a day when no man can work. Today's the day. 
The churches are in bed with the government. There's no faith in them. Look what they tell you. Let me just give you one example of, of, of just how derelict, if not demonic, the churches are. The churches allow the science, the scientists, the schools, the government of the world to convince every man, woman, and child that the God who told us to be fruitful and multiply, multiply and fill the earth was so inept as to not provide us enough air, enough water, enough food, enough the very essential of life. And that if we don't reduce the world's population, if we don't, uh, we don't reduce our consumption of the natural resources that God provided, we're going to all die. They're, they're doing their best to turn every one of us into our, ver, our own particular version of Greta Thunberg. Do you know how blasphemous that little kid is? Every time she opens her mouth, she defies the word of God. She calls the God of glory inept that he didn't provide enough water, air, and natural resources, no, not enough food to sustain a whole world full of people. She's just a puppet on a string. And Satan controls everything that she says. Why? Because the churches are emasculated. They believe the grand delusion that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. They frustrate Christ. They frustrate his grace. They frustrate his gospel. They render themselves impotent. And they're going down to the pit. Because they won't stand up against anybody. They won't stand up against the wolf in sheep's clothing behind the pulpit. They won't stand up against the governor, the mayor, the city council. They won't stand up against the phony federal government. They won't stand up against the schools, the phony scientists who teach nothing but lies, blasphemous lies that our God is inept. You see the consequences of believing in futurism? Completely helpless and hopeless in the world. That's what the churches are. They raise up Christians that are just waiting for the rapture. They're no good for anything else. There is a cost for believing this delusion called futurism. A tremendous cost that God's people just simply do not comprehend. It's got to be spelled out to you. God's people are supposed to be a factor in this world. In the first century, it was said, even in the scriptures, that they were turning the world on its head. They made nations and kings crumble and tremble. What can be said of Christianity today? They're on their couches just waiting for the rapture. That's the best that can be said. They believe a lie and they're completely powerless to do anything. And they even complain that the churches are dead. And when we pray, it's as if our, our, our prayers bounce off the ceilings. Now you know why. What are you going to do about it? I'll tell you what I've done about it. I'm getting out of the churches, and I'm going to tell the truth to anybody who'll sit still long enough to hear it. Totally corrupt. That's what the churches are. Totally corrupt. Just like the government. They don't have any faith in Christ. Useless and worthless, that's what we are. Are we going to repent? We're going to stay in our filthy ways. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. I think that was very, very needed, that little excursion you gave us there. 
I want to continue until the end of the second paragraph on this page until the finishing of this video because we already have reached an hour but I think it is uh, important that we repeat this reading here of Hebrews chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 because it really firmly connects Jesus Christ's coming in the flesh with his high priestly ministry and with his present ability to save us from sin. The Bible says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make a reconciliation for the sins of the people. As Tom said, a direct um, pointing to Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Again, the truth is established. Because Jesus Christ was made like us in the flesh and was tempted like we are, he is now fully able as our high priest to help us when we are tempted. His arms are open wide. Even though we are unworthy and foolish sinners, we can still come boldly to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We need no other mediator. We can be direct. This is all part of our confession. Now the author continues to say it's time to tie this in with Antichrist. Now we were speaking about the ID, the identification of Antichrist. Well, that's something for the 42nd, the next reading and discussion Tom and I are going to do of this subject. But this is one of the absolute key sentences the author puts here. We need no other mediator. When you are a member of the Roman Catholic Church and they say that you need to pray to the dead saints and you need to pray to the dead Mary, the Queen of Heaven, to help you to have a connection with God, you know by reading these verses of the Bible that they are lying right there out of their mouths and they cannot be teaching Jesus Christ, not the Jesus Christ of the Bible, but the Babylonian Tammuz. We need no other mediator but Jesus Christ. He is the only mediator between man and God. There is no other name given under the sun by which by which man must be saved, but the name Christ Jesus. That's more or less how the Bible states it. And I want to leave the final comments of this wonderful session to my brother, Tom Fress. I'll just close with my usual, sal my usual sal salutation. Blessing in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Christ Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world, the true and only King of kings and Lord of lords. Blessings in his name forever, the Alpha and Omega. See you next time. the great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. So confident were that our founders and their idea about one generational responsibility one to the next, that they were confident that our country, that what they were putting forth would exist for the ages, for the ages. That was the challenge they gave us.
that is the responsibility that we have. And for a couple of hundred years or more, that has always been the case. We're here today because we believe that, and we believe that the public policy that we put forth, the legislation we put forth should result in public policy that makes the future better. Uh, the Earth Summit Environmental Leadership Act, as this is known, presents us with an opportunity to follow up on the important work of the Earth Summit to develop its blueprint, Agenda 21, for envir global environmental action. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. Now watch this drive. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. His Holiness gave us a message of hope, peace, and dialogue. He challenged us to engage in dialogue, to move forward for the American people. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. If you've retired, you don't have anything to worry about. It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda.